So again, much of the difficulty here is uh, just making sure you're doing the perturbation theory right and working with the two bases uh, correctly. But now we're in a good position. We can combine our results. We had, um, so here is uh, what I want to combine. I want, in principle, to combine all, all things, all the terms. And we've calculated all the terms to some degree. So we saw the Darwin term only affects L equals 0. On the other hand, spin orbit uh, really requires S dot L at the state should be uh, eigenstate, but well, not eigenstate, but should be acted on trivially by L. If all your states are singlets, L um, gives 0 on them. So actually, uh, you have a little bit of an uncomfortable situation because L, acting on L equals zero states, will give you zero, but you still have the one over R cube, and the one over R cube has L dependences here, so it's zero in the denominator, zero in the numerator. The whole spin orbit coupling doesn't seem to make sense for L equals zero. So most people say, physically, the spin orbit coupling vanishes for L equals zero. It should not be there. But then something very funny happens. If you take a proper limit of this as L goes to zero, it gives you, for the spin orbit result, the same thing as the Darwin result. So for L equals zero, the spin orbit limit is actually the same as the Darwin is almost as if you say, oh, the spin orbit has everything in it, but it's not legal for L equals zero, but the Darwin does it. So if I put together the spin orbit and relativistics for L different from zero, I'm legal. For L equals zero, I should really sum relativistic and Darwin. But actually, it turns out that it's the same as summing relativistic plus spin orbit, because the limit of spin orbit for L equals 0 is equal to the Darwin. So we will just sum relativistic plus spin orbit, and that gives the result for everything, including Darwin, for L equals 0. So this is a minor subtlety, but uh, the end result is that we can combine it. Uh, so the happy thing as well is that we now can do this, mj delta h relativistic plus delta h spin orbit and lj mj. Because whatever we calculated here was actually the same that h relativistic in the coupled basis. And anyway, the spin orbit, we use the coupled basis to get this number. So this thing, you can add the two results, and you get en0 squared over 2mc squared, 3 plus 2n, j, j plus 1 minus 3l, l plus 1 minus 3 quarters over L, L plus one half, L plus one, a little messy. Okay, something very unexpected happens now. It's something that when you do the algebra yourself, you, you say, wow, how did that happen? Um, here is the issue. We are trying to compute the splittings of the hydrogen atom. And for this, as we said, in the coupled basis, the degeneracies happen for a given 
value of n. So I'm getting good at doing this diagram. Uh, just, uh, so we're looking at a fixed n, n, and then you have all kind of degenerate states for various l's and j's. So is there a better way to rewrite this formula? And you say the following. Um, suppose you think of some states of fixed j, fixed j states, j. For example, these states, here's our l equals 1 over here. I have uh, one, two, three, three p three halves and three p one halves. Here I have three d five halves because this is l equals two. So two plus one half and two minus one half. So I have here states of fixed j two states with the same j, but they come from different l's. Because when you get a total j of some value, it can come from a lower l, l plus 1 half gives you that j, or it can come from a top j, l, with l minus 1 half giving you that j. So a given j value can arise from an l that is a half higher, or an L that is a half lower. So it, for a fixed J, it may be that L is equal to J minus 1 half, or L is equal to J plus 1 half. Now look at this quantity. We'll call this whole quantity F of JL. Very astonishingly, f of j l, when l is j minus a half, or f of j l, where l is j plus one half, you can calculate it. Put l equal j minus a half on that formula, and then put j, l equal j plus one half in that formula. You would say, it's going to be a mess. In fact, both cases are the same. And it gives you minus 2 over j plus 1 half. So the whole L dependence here, amazingly, is fake. There's no L dependence in this factor. It's a little strange. There's no L dependence because given j, L can be two values. And for those two values, that function gives you the same. It's one of those, like x squared gives the same for 1 and minus 1. This function, can, once you fix j, l can be two values. And it so happens that these two values give the same. So at the end of the day, this just depends on j. That's the most important result of this lecture. The whole structure, once you put relativity, Darwin, and Spin orbit just depends on j. And what is the result when you simplify this? Our result is that um, the fine structure E, N, L, J, M, J, fine structure, one, is equal to minus alpha to the fourth mc squared, one over two n to the fourth n over j plus one half minus three quarters. Whole answer, all together, Darwin, Fine, uh, spin orbit and relativistic.
So uh, a few comments about this. Uh, people that look at the Dirac equation more seriously would have expected this result. It turns out that in the Dirac equation, the symmetry and the rotations, the generator of rotations, is exactly j, which is L plus s. That generates rotation. That commutes with the Hamiltonian. So you should expect that the energy eigenstates are j eigenstates. So here we're seeing that, yes, they can be simultaneously diagonalized. The eigenstates can also be labeled by the j value. So the exact eigenstates in the Dirac equation can be labeled by the j value, and we're seeing a reflection of this. Uh, this means that the j multiplets are not going to be split. And there's going to be, moreover, some degeneracy. They're not split because there's no mj dependence. And uh, they are all going to be the same. So let me finish by drawing how the spectrum looks. It's pretty important to see that. Um, this quantity over here, this numerical quantity, is always positive, positive for any state in the hydrogen atom. You can see that because J max, the maximum value, so this is negative. So you need to know what is the minimum value of this quantity to see if it goes negative. The minimum value of this ratio is when J is maximum. The maximum J is when J is L plus 1 half with the maximum L. So this is L plus 1 maximum. But L plus 1 maximum is, in fact, N. So the minimum value of this is 1, so it is always positive. Uh, as n increases, the corrections become smaller. So what happens? All the corrections are negative. So if you had the original states, they all go down a bit. Even the ground state goes out down a bit. 1, s, 1 half is down. Because for n equal 1, you do get a state. Then what do you get? 2s, 1 half is here. It's also down a bit. 3s, 1 half. So this is L equals 0. Then you have L equals 1. Remember what did we have here? Uh, we have 2p one half and two p three halves because l equal one gives you j equal three halves and one half. Look, this two remain degenerate because they have the same n and the same j, and that's all that matters. So one half and one half have the same j, so they remain degenerate. Two p three halves has a higher j, therefore has a smaller number, so it's lowered less, and it appears a little higher. So here you would have 3p 1 half, and here 3p 3 halves. And the next state here is 3 um, d. Now you're combining L equal 2, so you get 5 halves and 3 halves. The 3 halves is degenerate with these 3 halves because it has the same J, and the 5 halves is a little higher. 3D 5 halves. So this is our final picture of the hydrogen atom. All the states get pushed down the various multiplets with um, different L, but the same J, are still degenerate. This formula has no L dependence, so these two are the same. These two are the same. These two are the same. Moreover, the, P, the J multiplets are not split. Every J multiplet differs, has a collection of states with different 
MJ, but MJ doesn't appear. So this is your fine structure of hydrogen atom, and this is where you study in detail the Zeeman splitting and the Stark uh, splitting. And we'll talk a little bit about them next time as we will begin also our study of the semi-classical approximation. See you then.